This Real Egg Radio podcast is brought to you by High Performing Carbine Insecticide from FMC. Carbine Insecticide delivers fast, selective, and extended control of aphids in alfalfa and pulses, leaving beneficials like lady beetles to help in the fight. Ask your retailer today. It's time for Real Egg Radio on Rural Radio Channel 147 on Sirius XM. Real Egg Radio and RealEggCulture.com is your home for insight and analysis of the issues that are impacting your farm business. Let's get real and get connected with Real Egg Radio. Welcome to Real Ag Radio here on Rural Radio 147, a Sirius XM. Sean Haney, your host here on this Monday edition of the show. Hey, thanks so much for making Real Ag Radio and Rural Radio 147 a big part of your workday. And of course, big shout out out there to everybody listening on the Real Ag Radio podcast in Canada, the U.S. or beyond. Make sure you're telling your friends, your neighbors, your enemies, whoever about uh, this show. If they're interested in agriculture, this is the place to be. Hopefully you had yourself a great weekend. Lots sports-wise. The women's basketball final, college basketball, was amazing. What a great game between South Carolina and Iowa. Star-studded affair, uh, and uh, it was awesome. I enjoyed it so much. Of course, a little bit of WrestleMania on Saturday and Sunday night. Who doesn't? That was a pretty cool thing to have The Rock come back. The Undertaker even. Oh, anyway, we won't get into wrestling. <laughs> also, uh, tonight is the men's final in basketball. So it's, uh, yeah, big sports weekend indeed. Okay, if you have any feedback on today's show, you can send me an email, shaney at realagriculture.com. Or, of course, you can find us across all the different social media platforms. You can also call the Real Life Feedback Line. That number is 855-776-6147. It is Agronomic Monday here today, so Peter Wee Pete Johnson will be with us. And uh, Pete and I are going to talk about a number of different things. One of the things I want to chat with him about is the impact of compaction from the sprayer. Now, typically, we talk about the tractor. We talk about the combine, the grain cart, other implements, the, the, obviously the Super B rolling through the field. But we don't talk a lot about the sprayer, and we should, because it's making uh, the most passes of any sort of implement that we are using throughout the growing season. We're going to also talk about resistant kochia, resistant water hemp. Uh, tonight is the agronomist. We're going to profile and, and preview that episode that is on tonight as as well. So we've got a lot to chat about, the the two of us. And, you know, we are now to April 8th, and so the season I've seen people scratching around. There's there's a few that the eager beavers out there. So that that is uh, that's a very very good sign of spring diesel fuel burning, uh, dirt moving, and uh, some seed going in the ground sparingly in 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 parts of Canada. But uh, it is happened, of course, corn planting well underway in in parts of uh, the U.S. and some of that TLC and taking care of some of that winter wheat in the U.S. as well. Uh, Pete's going to talk about the wheat crop. In Ontario, and uh, so there is, uh, yeah, it's that time of year. This is kind of the fun time. We're talking about the farmer rapid fire. This is kind of the time where things really get going. So uh, I love it because this is when you're out in your your tractors, and uh, we get lots of fan feedback as well. Speaking of the feedback, keep it coming. We we talked about our real agri study survey related to how farmers feel trade impacts them. We got a ton of feedback uh, from that discussion on Friday's show and Wednesdays. I'm going to pr- probably get to feedback on Wednesday's show, so keep it coming. And if you missed uh, Friday's show, I encourage you to go back and listen to it on the podcast. You can also, of course, uh, find the story that I wrote at realagriculture.com. So I encourage you to do that because there's some very, very interesting findings there. Younger farmers appreciate or feel see more value and positive impact in trade. And larger farmers show the least positive impact when it comes to trade. Some very interesting dynamics happening there. Indeed, check that out for sure. Would love to keep ha, keep getting your feedback on that. S. Haney at realagriculture.com. Hey, we're going to take a break. And when we come back, we're going to get going with Agronomic Monday. Peter Reed, Pete Johnson will be here right after this. 
we're now going to discuss the Pest and Predator podcast. Joining us right now to talk about Season 5 is Dr. Megan Venkoski. She is with AFC in Saskatoon. So what can listeners expect here in Season 5? Well, uh, a whole bunch of different topics are going to be discussed by entomologists from across Canada. Myself and a couple colleagues, we recorded a podcast about potentially invasive species to the prairies. Uh, which are something we want people to be aware of and watch out for. Dr. Maya Evenden is recording a podcast about the ecology of fear and how just the presence of an enemy, of, of a predator or a parasitoid, can impact a pest. It doesn't have to be a direct relationship. It can be uh, indirect. And of course, then we have other podcasts about some specific pests and their interactions with their uh, with their predators and parasitoids. So the podcast series for 2024 is due to start airing March 18th, and then they'll be bi-weekly after that until the end of May. At Vatterstad, we aim to be the world's leading partner for outstanding emergence. We're doing that through innovative tillage, planting, and seeding equipment that's optimized for your field conditions and soil types. We also offer industry-leading capacities to help you get the job done in shorter windows of time. It's all designed to give your crop the best start possible so you can maximize yields. Vatterstad, we look forward to growing together. And welcome back to Real Ag Radio here on Agronomic Monday. Co-op knows your community because we live here too. Our teams are your trusted partners with a range of expertise to help support your entire farm operation. Here for your co-op, here for your farm, here for your family. Learn more by going to co-op's website. It is co-op.crs slash farm. Sean Haney, your host here on this Monday, and as always, joined by my colleague at Real Agriculture, it is uh, Peter Wee, Pete Johnson. Pete, how's it going? It's going awesome, thanks, Sean. We had a glorious weekend. It was sunshine, and things were drying up, and growers are are getting into the field. I actually saw a tweet from Warren Schneckenberger. He was out in the field testing out an RTS. So that's true ver- vertical tillage, you know, shallow, not very deep. The dust was flying, man. So it's like, wowzers that we are getting close. We aren't, we aren't there. We are putting some nitrogen on wheat to just, just at the beginning of that, but uh, no, no real field work, but close. Yeah. And, and dust flying sort of, I guess, shows a little bit of some of the dry bias that's out there in Southwestern Ontario. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, we're not dry, dry, dry. Although, Oh, a lot of people say when you get three, four feet deep, it's drier than normal. We we normally get a hundred percent moisture recharge, and I'm not sure we got that this this year. It was so dry in February that that uh, we're we're certainly not dry like Western Canada dry. Okay, but yeah. uh, we we are we are maybe not quite as much subsoil moisture as normal. Yeah, everybody has their own definition of dry. It, it's all relative, right? Like that's. Uh... But that, that is that's that's for sure 100 percent, yeah uh, hey uh how was your weekend what'd you do oh so uh hey if really cool my granddaughters and daughter-in-law from the uk are here so my son joel uh, he works with basf there and he couldn't make the trip back but it's it's a break week for them and so they came back to visit family which is very cool we're uh we're gonna have supper again with them tonight on monday night and then they actually head back to the uk on uh, tomorrow on tuesday but that was that was awesome and then on saturday it was such a nice day that uh, you know johnson was out trying to get some some work done around the house we just have a bunch of yard work to do okay and uh eh, it was time so that was a, a good deal for me on sun on saturday rather yep oh cool well that's good that's good okay let's talk about agronomy there's lots to chat about here as we creep towards uh some of that field work being done and i did it just like you talked about how s- some people were dragging some implements around in ontario did see it as well in in western canada and uh, i want to talk about sprayers and compaction now typically when we talk about compaction i think we tend to talk about four-wheel drive tractors a lot of times we talk about the grain cart a lot of times we talk about the combine we don't necessarily talk about sprayers and we should because the sprayer is the implement that probably makes the most passes of any other unit that we have on the farm. You and I over the weekend 
shared some data back and forth in terms of sprayer compaction uh, information. What what does that tell us, Pete? What, what when we think about compaction in the sprayer, what what are the things that we need to keep top of mind? Yeah, so really, it's it's the same as any piece of equipment. And Sean, when you say we don't think about sprayers, man, I think we should. That should be one of the first things we think about because oftentimes when we're in a crop like wheat, we're trying to tramp as little as possible. And so we put these skinny little tires on the sprayer and sprayers, just like everything else, are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And it used to be, man, if you had a 120 foot boom, that was a big boom. Nowadays, they've got 160 foot booms. And so think about the weight of that boom when you fold it out how it changes the balance of that sprayer because when it's all folded in and resting, it's fairly central in terms of its weight distribution. You fold it out, whether it's front fold or back fold, whichever way it goes, now all of a sudden you have this great big lever, 160 foot wide boom hanging out at the back there. They got to build them stronger to get them that much wider. Stronger means more weight. Plus we're now, what, 1600 gallon sprayer is pretty common. We, we're getting some 2,000, some 2,400 gallon sprayers. So the amount of weight on that sprayer and the weight distribution, and then I'm in my wheat crop. So I want to run on these skinny little 11 inch tires. So I only tramp one row of wheat in my seven and a half inch wheat. Or if I'm Western Canada, I'm, I'm trying not to tramp anything between the 12 inch row wheat, which is a little bit tough. But the other thing is when I need to spray, I'll push it way more than I will with some other operations. If those weeds, if I need to kill them and it's plenty wet, but I can get through, I'm going. Of course, the wetter the soil, the more compactable it is. Mm -hmm. And yeah, sprayers are, are one of the number one problems when it comes to compaction and keep them in the same track all the time. In Australia, they do that. They're controlled traffic farming and they actually have designed tools because the sprayer will go through the field enough times, even under their dry conditions, that they'll end up with four to six, sometimes even eight inch deep ruts where the sprayer tracks are. And they have tools that they go through and they're designed just to fill those two ruts that the sprayer left behind so they can start fresh the next year. But but yeah, compaction from a sprayer, it, it's hardcore harsh. So would a person be better off to go with the fatter tires? Maybe potentially damage more crop, but you, you're going to have less compaction issues? Or is that math just that too big of a math equation to sort out? Oh, no, we got that, like, we have this discussion all the time. When do I switch from the floaters? Because right now, if we're putting nitrogen on wheat, almost for sure we're running floaters. And it's because with floaters, we can get a much bigger footprint, the much bigger footprint. Now I can run the pressure in my tire a lot lower, and I create less compaction. But the growing point of the wheat crop is still below the ground. So if I don't do that damage, I, I don't generally cause much injury now you got to be a bit careful depends on how big the weed is but then as soon as that growing point comes above the ground man you better you better be running the skinnies because then the wides really do a lot of tramp damage and i think i'm not sure if we talked about it last week or not but dave hooker tweeted out a, a great picture of tramp damage in a in a wheat crop where it, it, I, I'm not even sure it was wheat. It was so big on the 24th of March. I think it was about the 24th of March that they went ran through it. And they went through it with a terrigator. So, with, you know, three big wheels, a, a tricycle, basically. And each wheel is three feet wide. And you're going a 70-foot boom. And I now just tramp nine feet out of 70 feet. And the amount of tramp damage was just horrendous. And you go, come on, people. Like, we got to do better than that. Okay, now it's not just about the sprayer weight either, right? Because there's a if you look across different manufacturers, there are different weights, obviously empty and 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 loaded. But we don't just necessarily assume that the heaviest sprayer would have the worst compaction because there's more in there's more to it than that, right? Well, well, it's about balance, right, Sean? So if the if the heaviest sprayer can balance the weight equally with the boom folded out and the, and the tank full, because that's when you're going to get maximum compaction. If you can balance it so there's the same amount of weight on the front axle as there is on the back axle, 
then you're actually going to cause less compaction than a lighter sprayer where they can only keep 30% of the weight on the front axle or, or the back axle, depending on which way the boom folds, but let's say the front axle and 70% of weight on the back axle. It's all about weight per axle or weight per tire. In the compaction days that we've done, we've even seen that one side of the sprayer will be significantly heavier than the other side of the sprayer, even when they're fully loaded. And that's generally the fuel tank that causes that. But on little skinny tires and you start putting, you know, 200 gallons or 150 gallons of fuel in that tank and it's on one side, that, like that can make a significant difference, particularly when it's by one wheel in particular. And yeah, we, we've seen lots of cool stuff at our compaction days on sprayers. They're, they're fun to work with. The combines, you know, it's always the, the steering axle that's a problem on the combine. We all think about the front tires, the drive wheels, the tracks. Nope. That isn't the compaction problem. It's the steering axle. That's where the compaction happens. And of course, you mentioned buggies. They're, they're bad as well. Uh, yeah. the, uh, the number of times we've seen buggies where the tire that was on it was not rated to carry the load of that grain cart full Ooh. is is unbelievable. Just unbelievable. They, if ever a tire blew out going down the road and the thing was full and somebody got hurt, uh, man, uh, the, the legal ramifications of that worry me. They really do. We have talked about tire type. One thing we didn't cover a lot of here was the actual tire pressure. And the, the PSI of that tire also plays a role in that level of compaction and the disbursement of the weight. Yeah, 100%. And so that's the problem, right? I go to a skinny t tire on a sprayer, and I got to run it at 90 PSI. And at 90 PSI, man, the, the amount of surface compaction that happens is, is cruel. It's just cruel. But don't forget, like, you're absolutely right. Tire pressure is one factor, but tire pressure dictates more the surface soil compaction. Axle weight dictates this deeper soil compaction. Mm. So once I go to, you know, even a, a, like a nice floater on the sprayer, I can get my tire pressure down to, say, 15 PSI, which is sort of the target we aim for. Rare we can get a sprayer that low, but, but say I could. Oh man, if it's still a it's a twenty four hundred gallon sprayer, I'm still going to create deep compaction, even with the you know a much better tire reducing surface compaction. It's just just the the dynamics of how that works. Well, th there was a I'm trying to remember who it was. It was a it was a very old, experienced, uh, old wise agronomist that said to me one time. 80% of compaction happens on that first pass. Man, that, 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 that number is very, very staggering when you think about it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that, that old agronomist probably was me because that's the number we use. And I am old. I'll give you that, Sean. But uh, I'm still, I, hey, any day above the ground is a good day. I, I'm still above the ground. So that's good. I'm still absolutely. having fun. And by the way, that's why you stay in the same tracks if you can, because then you don't spread that compaction over the whole field. Better to keep it in a confined area if you can at all. Yeah, that makes that makes a a, a lot of sense. It, compaction. I, I think it's really a under discussed topic. Uh, uh, so, like, yeah, go ahead. We we talk about it lots in Ontario. Ontario is really working hard at it. Uh, Ohio is working hard at it. it. It's it's. You're right. We haven't paid enough attention, Sean. One of the reasons we didn't pay attention is we had no solution. We now have some solutions. We have tracks. We have central tire inflation systems. We can put more axles under it. Like. Third time in my career that compaction's been talked about. First time in my career, we actually have some reasonable solutions for the problem. Well, but I think a lot of people also make the assumption that, well, um, I, I don't have a lot of moisture in my soil, therefore I don't have like I don't have compaction. Um, and you know and that's not true. Either. That's like one of those that that's a myth, right? Right. right. That that's another myth. You you don't cause as much surface compaction but you still cause compaction, particularly at deeper depths. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, Pete, I want to tell you about Field Heroes. It's powered by Western Grains Research Foundation. Visit fieldheroes.ca to learn how beneficial insects can benefit your farm. And of course, Field Heroes and WGRF, also big partners with our Pest and Predator podcast. We have new episodes dropping I think every two weeks, and they are in incredibly interesting conversations. Last week was a trio of entomologists. And uh, we had a lot of fun. It, some of those, and entomologists can be very funny. There's some humorous parts. 
in that episode on invasive species. Okay, we'll be, we've got more coming up here on Real Ag Radio on Agar McMonday with Peter Weepy Johnson and Sean Haney right after this. Through a growing storm of kosher, cleavers, chickweed, and more, there's a clear path. Introducing Oxbow, a versatile cereal broadleaf herbicide that gets the job done. Powered by Duplisan technology, Oxbow is your workhorse on resistant kosha and other tough weeds. With flexibility in timing, rates, and recropping options, your path is clear. Find your way on the path of least resistance at newfarm.ca slash oxbow. Before you get back in the field this year, spend some time with the Corn School on realagriculture.com. Get all the information you need on hybrid selection, planting depth, crop inputs, and more from a wide range of industry experts. A massive library of video content is available on demand when you need it most. Spend your time outside of the field, inside the classroom, with the Corn School on realagriculture.com. Peter Johnson at WheatPeatRealAgriculture.com, and what an opportunity! Oh my gosh! You think you can't grow better wheat? You are absolutely wrong. We're going to show you how to strive for those record wheat yields that they get in the UK and in New Zealand. You can grow 150 bushel wheat. I'll show you how. Catch Wheat Pete's Word every Wednesday on RealAgriculture.com or download the podcast on iTunes or Spotify. I am looking so forward tonight to the final for the for the final four. UConn versus Purdue. If I was probably total up the audience here on Rural Radio, I, I'm pretty sure that we've got way more Purdue fans out there uh, listening. So best of luck. I, I'm cheering for Purdue because Zach Eady, Canadian, you know, the center for Purdue. I, I'm hoping that uh, a lot of people doubting him. I heard somebody this morning say they don't even think he'll play in the NBA because there's no room for that kind of center anymore, which is uh, which is mind-boggling. Hopefully somebody takes a chance on him. Because remember, basketball only has two rounds in the NBA draft. It's a <laughs> pretty small roster when it comes to a, a basketball team. So that Final Four tonight will be great. Cattle markets are destined to rise and fall. Make sure you're protected from unexpected price drops with livestock price insurance. Price protection for calves is available now through to June 13th. For more information, visit lpi.ca. Okay, Sean Haney, Peter Wheat, Pete Johnson. Oh, Pete, you know, I asked you what you did on the weekend. Did you, I I know that you're a closet wrestling fan. Did you watch WrestleMania on Sunday and Saturday? I was too busy to watch TV on the weekend, Sean. Come on. (laughs) Well, I enjoyed it. It Well, good for you. I am, by the way, I'm not a closet wrestling fan. (laughs) It just, uh, oh. Like, life's lessons all resort back to something that happened on wrestling, Pete. I, I yeah, Lindsay always <laughs> makes fun of me about that, but uh, it was pretty cool. It was good. The lots of stuff happened in that main event on Sunday, so it was. Yeah, it was I, uh, I I'll it. have to I'll have to try to watch maybe. Although I thought life lessons all were taught by Doctor Zeus, so there you see, I'm I'm right. wrong again. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. <laughs> Okay, let's talk about uh, the condition of that wheat crop in Ontario. We've got some purple wheat. We got some challenges. Uh, what is up? Yeah, so Sean, you know I love wheat because it just out of all the crops we deal with, and and I'm not exactly sure why. And people are going to say, oh, just because Johnson's a wheat guy, but it's it's really true. Even Russ Barker, another great agronomist, he says wheat tells all. It just shows everything. Every mistake. Every soil issue, the wheat crop, for some reason, just has a story to tell about that. Okay, pause. More so than corn. Oh, way more than corn. Really? Way more than corn. I, I thought corn was like the, like when you call it the princess crop all the time, I thought it was because it, it, it really showed, it was, it didn't work well in adversity. and it, like, well, it, well, Corn doesn't handle adversity at all, but. You can't, you can't walk into a cornfield and see the patterns the way you can in a wheat field. Uh, okay, okay, I see what you mean. And okay. part of it is, part of it, Sean, is because corn is 30-inch centers, 30-inch rows, uh, 75 centimeters if you want to, and, and wheat is seven and a half. So I get four wheat rows to every corn row. So the corn crop can, can tolerate a few 
fertilizer misapplication problems because it's got this 30 inch zone it can draw from whereas i have four wheat rows if i if i screw up with application there's going to be one of those wheat rows that doesn't get any nitrogen or sulfur or phosphorus or whatever i screwed up with and that row is going to show me that it's got a problem and even though wheat is not a princess like it it does not need to be babied the way the the corn crop does but it also responds more to management than most other crops. And so because of that, when it does hit a problem, it shows. And so right now, the wheat crop is telling such a story in Ontario. When you look at purple wheat, you know right away that that soil does not have good internal drainage. The heavy clays are showing it, but even in like you can just drive through the countryside and you can see, oh, that field, I know it was never rotated well. It, you know, it hasn't been rotated well. They, they beat it up with, with either compaction or some other, other process. And the wheat in those fields is purple, where the wheat right beside it, where they've done a good rotation, maybe they've got a little better drainage or you know, whatever, that wheat is not purple at all. And so we're, it's telling us this story. We're seeing tile run wheat. And get this, Sean, I have a client. And he could see the tile run wheat in where he, plant, where he had wheat after black beans. He could not see the tile run wheat where he had the wheat after cranberry beans. And man, I was scratching my head and scratching my head. I finally got a chance to really walk the field on Friday. And as I walked it, it finally hit me that the wheat on black beans we planted about 10 days earlier. And even though they were both planted timely, where the black beans were, that wheat had just got a lot more growth and over the tile runs and just one foot wide over the tile runs. Wasn't four feet wide or six feet wide. It was one foot wide over the tile runs. That wheat was three to four inches taller and darker green and more tillers. And it was, it's because it was just that much drier through our wet fall period. And that wheat was advanced enough to take advantage of that drier condition. Whereas the later planted wheat just never got far enough in its growth to take advantage of that. So the, uh, the sand knolls, I walk sand knolls right away. The wheat is poor. And you say, why is the wheat poor here? Is it pH? Is it a phosphorus problem? Like there's something else. It's not drainage because sand generally drains better. But again, the wheat will tell you, is it manganese? I mean, we're actually starting to see a little bit of manganese deficiency show up here and there. So yeah, it's just so cool from that perspective. Yeah, and I know you're getting a lot of questions about nitrogen application on, yeah, on, on wheat. Uh, this is you know, a lot of these questions over the past number of weeks. Uh, any updates or tips you can uh, give the audience out there with uh, winter wheat out in the field? Yeah, so it's time. In Ontario, it's time. Now, again, Ontario is a big pro province, and maybe if I, if I was up in the New Lisker district, they may still have snow up there. It may not be time there. But for the majority of, of southwestern Ontario, and it's really interesting because growers, because of the focus on nitrogen, they're now a lot more concerned about, will I cause loss? Is it going to you know get denitrified? Because I think I've had four or five people between email and Twitter and, and text ask me, is today the day, Wednesday, there's an inch of rain forecast, Saturdays, there's an inch of rain forecast, but the field is fit on Monday. Do I put the nitrogen on? And the answer is absolutely, particularly if it's a split application. If it was a, a single one-shot deal, we're a little early for that. But if you're split applying and split application, it just it's better for the environment, uh, much less chance of nitrogen lost as as a greenhouse gas, which is a good thing, lets you make better management decisions with your second application. Doesn't always mean more yield. That's the real frustrating part. So sometimes you make two trips and get no more yield and in, in, in nothing more in your pocketbook but it makes you a better farmer. So I, I like split applications. It is time for the first application. Don't forget, the first inch of rain just moves the nitrogen into where the root zone is. And so then it has to stay saturated for an extended period of time to lose much. So I'm really glad that growers are thinking about it and asking the question, because it tells me that, that they're way more up on it and, and educated than, than we were 10 or 15 years ago. That's awesome. But 
but it, yeah, you, I mean, if you're going to wait for the perfect day to do any farming operation, uh, you might not get that until 2025. So it's 2024. I think it's time to farm. Yeah, the, the, the perfect day don't exist, uh, or at least it feels like it's kind of rare. Now, th this morning I was listening to a financial news show, and they were talking about whether an eclipse is good for the markets or not. And they'd kind of had some fun with it and gone back. And, of course, they, they there isn't enough eclipses to assume normal distribution, so they were just having more fun. I'll ask you, is the eclipse good for yields for 2024? Any any scientific data on that, Pete, at all? Or are we just uh, – Oh, wait a minute. Are you, you really want scientific data, Sean? Because if it's scientific data you want, the answer is we don't have enough eclipses to have any stinking idea. And, by the way, we could have no side-by-side -side trial. Because oh, it happens this year. You're going to pull that out of your hat on this <laughs> one. Okay, fine. But but regardless, I'm going to say, because I'm an eternal optimist, I'm going to say that absolutely, eclipses are amazing for yields on all crops across all of North America. 2024 is going to be awesome. Love your positivity. Hey, you got two choices in life, Sean, and mm. I choose to be to be positive because because being negative is no fun to me, man. And so I, you you be optimistic, but also be realistic. Uh, that's that's my biggest problem when it comes to marketing my crop. I don't always have opt or realistic enough uh, objectives to sell. Sometimes I'm overly optimistic, and then sometimes I'm left holding crop that I should have sold six months ago, which is the case today. As somebody that has spent their life in extension, when you walk into your own fields, do you find yourself being hypercritical? The answer is absolutely. Uh, and I scout for other clients as well. So, yeah. and it's been like, it's really good. When I walk into my own field, it's kind of like, what? Like, I'm the weak guy. I'm supposed <laughs> to know what the heck I'm doing. Like, look at this mess. Holy crap. <laughs> I, I better get a better agronomist. Who is so, well? You know what? Lawyers hire lawyers, right? Yeah, yeah Maybe absolutely. You need to get an agronomist, <laughs> right? I need a better agronomist, a hundred percent, Sean. I need a better agronomist and a better driver in the tractor seat, and you name it. <laughs> Bill Needham, where are you? I need yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> Oh, man. Okay, this segment was brought to you by the pre-emergent soil active herbicides of Altera EZ and Fierce EZ from New Farm. Get ahead of hard-to-kill weeds, spray after spring thaw for up to eight weeks of extended weed control this spring. Find out more about New Farm products and talk to your local dealer. You could go to newfarm.ca. We've got a little bit more coming up here with Peter Wee, Pete Johnson and myself, Sean Haney, and we'll be right back right after this. Does your end stabilizer contain an active ingredient load high enough to be agronomically effective? If not, it could be costing you time and money. If you're putting down a nitrogen stabilizer, put your trust in Coke Agronomic Services. Solutions like SuperU, Tribune, and Anvil. Each delivers high active ingredient concentrations that low rate products just can't match. Compare how imitator products stack up to agronomically effective solutions at defendyourn.ca. Hi, I'm Bernard Tobin, host of The Soybean School on realagriculture.com. Throughout the year, On The Soybean School will bring you timely agronomic video content from planting to harvest, from the latest agronomic research to the latest in production technology. Check out our massive video library on YouTube, realagriculture.com, or download the audio podcast versions wherever you get your podcasts. The Soybean School is brought to you by BASF and Syngenta Canada. Welcome back to Real Ag Radio here on Rural Radio 147, Sirius XM. For every acre you work, Coke Agronomic Services has an answer to help. From nitrogen protection to micronutrients and seed enhancers, discover a portfolio of solutions designed to solve the problems that you face on your farm. You can find answers by going to cokeag.ca. Sean Haney, Peter Wheat, Pete Johnson. Oh, hey, Pete, tonight, agronomist. Real Ag in prime time, 8 o'clock Eastern, 6 o'clock Mountain. And you can watch it on the Real Agriculture YouTube channel. You can also see it at realagriculture.com slash live. Uh, we also stream it through Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn. But uh, easiest way is on the YouTube channel. 
And tonight, it's kind of a special treat for a number of reasons. So the topic is all about soybean diseases. Okay, so if you're growing soybeans in Canada and the U.S., this is an episode that you're going to want to check out. And they're going to be talking about soybean cyst nematode and other soybean diseases. But we have the brothers Tanuda, as I like to call them. Uh, we've got Albert and Mario Tanuda in one place at one time. This is going to uh, explode the myth that they're actually the same person. They are not. And uh, I love the Tanudas, uh, a great wealth of information, and uh, both of them being in the same place. I, I'm not sure that uh, YouTube is prepared for what could come out of tonight's episode. We, we may well break the internet tonight, Sean. We get Mario and Albert together, and, and and what myth that they're the same person. If you ever get the two of them together, it's like, no, they're, they're, they're brothers, but they're different. There's yeah. no doubt about that. But it'll be an awesome session. They're both like such incredibly intelligent people and and do such great work in terms of in many different uh, areas right but but albert in particular loves his soybean cyst nematode and his soybean diseases like he he will say oh look at look at that field that that's great and i'm looking at it saying that is the worst dang disaster i ever saw in my yeah. life like what are you talking about but uh it will be good fun. Make sure you bring your questions for them on soybean stuff because there's not – you put the two of them together, there's not many questions they, are, they can't answer, that's for sure. Yeah, and the beauty is of it, the, the, you know, the, the ge geographical knowledge here, right? So this isn't just an episode for growers in eastern Canada. This is you – know, we're able to cover both sides of, the, of Canada – as well as listeners and viewers from uh, the U.S. as well, because both Mario and uh, Albert do a lot of stuff south of the board, too, in collaboration on research. So this, this is an episode that covers a very vast geography. So again, and it's also a good thing that I'm not hosting tonight is Lindsay, She's, who is regularly the host, but a good thing I'm not a fill-in tonight, because Albert and I would just totally be, get derailed towards Blue Jays baseball. Oh, yeah. You wouldn't talk at all about, about soybeans. You would talk only about baseball. <laughs> yeah. yeah. If, I, if I was ever to start a baseball podcast, uh, Albert is on the list of people that uh, he, like, Albert loves his uh, Blue Jays baseball. So, And uh, his Toronto Maple Leafs. Anything Toronto. Albert grew up in Toronto, and he is a diehard Toronto fan, period. Yeah, yeah. I don't love the Blue Jays offense so far this year. That's... Uh, yeah has not been good so but uh well it'll come around i'm, I'm there's time there's I'm time a more, i'm a more opt you know toronto fans are very negative i'm a little bit more optimistic but uh i've been fooled before we'll, we'll we will see <laughs> um hey today i'm recording an episode of the wheat school with uh charles gettys dr charles gettys out of uh afc last bridge and we're gonna be talking about resistant kosher some survey data that he has this is a, an exploding problem in in parts of the prairies very very concerning because even when it when it didn't have resistance kosher was a massive issue and now that it has resistance it's like oh my goodness this is like this would be very difficult to manage i know you want to talk about water hemp because that's another one of these resistant weeds that creates major, major issues. And people have a couple of strategies on how to deal with it. How do cover crops on water hemp? How, how does that fit into the strategy, Pete? Yeah, so I, I listened to a really great session from the Ontario Ag Conference by uh, Charles Proctor. Uh, pardon me, not Charles, Chris Proctor. <laughs> I have Charles Gettys on the on the brain now. Chris Proctor uh, out of Nebraska and uh, uh, our own Francois Tardif out of University of Guelph. Yeah. And they were talking about, you know, more ways to whack weeds. And so water hemp has become a huge problem here in the province. Did you know, Sean, because this like these numbers blow me away. If you grow a single water hemp plant by itself, keep the competition away and just let it do its thing. And of course, it has to be a female plant because they're dioecious and it has to get, but, but a female plant, 4.8 million seeds. Whoa. 4.8 million, one plant. 4.8 million seeds. You, you talk, talk about being prolific. That's crazy. And then you put it in a competitive situation where it's got soybeans growing around it. That same one plant is 300,000 seeds, which is still, you know, if you have one plant in every 10 square meters, you've got 300,000 seeds in 10 square meters. Like that, that kind of pressure to try to ask any 
herbicide to control that many weed seedlings coming on, it gets really tough, right? So, so very, very hard to control it, period, just because of it, how prolific it is. And then you add resistance on top of that. And you add the fact that it can grow an inch a day. So its growth rate is phenomenal. Plus, as it grows every inch, it's like it's making more growing points. That's one of the reasons it's so hard to control is because a four inch tall plant sometimes can have as many as 30 growing points. And if you try to spray it with a post-emerge herbicide, that one plant isn't really one plant. It's 30 growing points that you have to control. And that just like everything is getting tougher and tougher. And then you bring in cover crops and you kind of say, well, like how does that even, even play? But what's really interesting in Chris Proctor's work is where they had cover crops and even reasonably small cover crops, not like we often talk about cover crops and the, the weed suppression we can get with cover crops. But what he saw was even with not too much growth, the cover crop could keep the soil enough cooler that that water hemp plant would not germinate, that seed wouldn't germinate until 30 to 50 days later. And if it germinated 50 days later, then with no cover crop, the no cover crop growing in the soybean crop, 300,000 seeds, that water hemp plant that, that was 50 days later to germinate, it only produced 3,000 seeds. And so that's sort of 1% as many seeds that you're returning by having the competition of that cover crop. And it's a soil temperature thing. And you kind of go, wow. So, so that means there's way more impact of that cover crop than you would have thought. It didn't, didn't kill the, the water hemp, didn't prevent it from, from germinating and being there, but 1% seed return compared to not having the cover crop there. And you just go, boy, that, that's a massive impact. And you talked about kosher. And, you know, Sean, last week, if you recall, we talked about kosher and the fact that it was germinating beside the bin. And Chad, uh, Peter's, uh, Chad, uh, sorry, I forget his last name, had tweeted out wondering about how the early, ultra early seeding wheat guys were killing the kosher in their wheat field because it was already germinating. But that was the heat of the bin that was getting that kosher to germinate because the soil was so much warmer right beside the bin. And then this cover crop session and I'm thinking, wow, so again, this soil temperature impact has a huge relationship to, to where we fit in weed control. And that's, I mean, that's just one factor. There's a bunch more that, that we could talk about, but it made, made me sit up and say, man, that is cool stuff. Now, I know with, I mentioned with kosher, it was a, probably one of the most prolific weed problems prior to resistance. Was that also the case with water hemp? Yeah, so the difference about water hemp is that it's it's moving north. We never had water hemp before. And by the way, uh, Chris Proctor also talked about, or no, it actually was Francois Tardif, talked about going to Arkansas. And so he takes the weeds team, and he went to Arkansas to compete. And they had this field, and all there was in the field was Palmer amaranth. And so when they killed all the Palmer amaranth, when they, like, when they were able to do that or they hand weeded it, then all there was was barnyard grass. And when they killed the barnyard grass, there was no weeds. Mm -hmm. And he kind of went, what? And they said, oh, the Palmer is, Palmer amaranth is so aggressive that it outcompetes all the other weeds. And if you've had Palmer for a while, the other weeds just almost disappear until you control the Palmer. (laughs) <laughs> right it's sort of like when you get sick of like the, the, oh, the city is just way too big we got to move to a place you know, remember when this was a small town it's grown too much we got to get out of here we're moving back to the country <laughs> it's yeah. on the weeds it's, are yeah exactly it's that sort of thing and and so with water hemp because it is it is spreading further north all the time so so is palmer by the way and and mm-hmm. so it sounds like it's it's even worse than water hemp yeah. but was water hemp always 
very prolific. Yeah, it's a pigweed. All the pigweed, all the amaranth species are are very, very prolific seed producers. So it's always been like that. And that's another reason why it develops resistance so easily because it's dioecious, right? It, it's male and female. So that means that you're always getting some cross-pollination, some some new potential resistance developing. Yep. And then if you get that, you got this stupid plant that creates whatever, 300,000 seeds. Now I got a big problem. What if, if we were to look at what causes damage, the more adversity or damage to our crop yields, Weeds, weeds would be more of a yield deterrent than insects, right? Well, I got to be careful. Some I do too. Would... I'm, I'm talking out loud here. I'm just yeah. thinking. And, and so, so I think, I think on a on a continual basis, you're 100 percent right, Sean. If you think about getting grasshoppers at high levels in a in a field in Western Canada, they can be devastating, right? They can be 100 percent crop loss or close to it. So, I I think you always have to be careful with that, but. Overall, your statement is 100% correct. If you look at Peter Sikma's research, you know, uh, if you, I think uh, edible beans, it's uh, weed, the loss to weed pressure is somewhere around 60% of the yield. If you look at corn, it's 50%. If you look at soybeans, it's 45%. When you get to winter wheat, you're actually down to 3% yield loss from weed pressure because winter wheat only only really suffers yield loss from the winter annual weeds and and it's a very competitive species with things like well you never see water hemp in a good winter wheat field because the winter wheat just out competes the, the water hemp and so it, it's not an issue there right but uh yeah overall weeds are your number one yield loss you know 90 95 percent of the time and you get those those occasional instances where the wire worm wipe out the entire sandy knoll right. of that field or right. So, so we have to be careful, but your statement's right. Okay. Well, appreciate you backing me up on that. It was just, it was <laughs> random thought that just popped in my head, which sometimes we need to be careful of yeah. uh, from nutrient management to the latest weather market and egg trends, the dirt and economics podcast is your place for farm smart topics to boost your profitability. Join Mike Howell on season three of the dirt podcast available now by going to nutrient dash economics with a K dot com. We've been talking to Peter Wheat, Pete Johnson. And Pete, we are out of time. This has been fantastic. Uh, great stuff. I really appreciate you joining me here on this Monday. And we have our Real Ag team meeting this week. So I'm going to see you in the flesh in person at the back end of the week. And I'm looking forward to it. Me as well, Sean. It'll be a blast. So just get ready for, you know, all the rude things I'm going to fire at you when, when we're there in person. <laughs> Quite snarky in person, this one. Quite snarky in person. <laughs> okay. We got uh, the real egg uh, top egg news for the day coming up right after this quick break. What's next for your fields? At Pioneer, delivering industry leading genetics drives everything we do. From the scientists in the lab to our local teams with boots on the ground, we are determined to get there first. Developing top performing products proven in more growing conditions than ever before. Pioneer. What's next happens here. Visit pioneer.com slash Canada to learn more. I'm Lindsay Smith from realagriculture.com. Join me Monday nights for The Agronomist, a one-hour live and interactive show broadcast across YouTube, Facebook, and X. Monday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern, I host expert agronomists from all over the country to give you answers to some of the toughest agronomic questions. Join us live or catch the replay Tuesday morning. That's The Agronomist with me, Lindsay Smith, Monday nights live at 8 p.m. Eastern. And welcome back to Real Ag Radio. It's now time for the top ag news stories of the day. For agronomically effective dual UAN inhibition, the smart answer is Tribune nitrogen stabilizer from Coke Agronomic Services. To learn how it, its two active ingredients protect UAN from three forms of nitrogen loss, visit cokeag.ca. Okay, let's get into the top ag news stories of the day here. And and up first, of course, we got the, the Bank of Canada. We were talking about the unemployment and the job numbers on Friday's show. The Bank of Canada is widely expected to keep interest rates steady this week for the sixth consecutive time. Though analysts are watching for a shift in tone that could open the door to rate cuts over the summer. The central bank has held its policy at 5%, at a, for which is a two-decade high since July. 
But with the economy languishing and inflation back inside the bank's target range, many Bay Street economists and traders expect monetary policy to pivot in the coming months, perhaps as early as June. I said on Friday, show and I stand by it. I think the Canada cuts rates before the U.S. does, based on the data that is in front of us. Is that ideal? No, but I think it's going to happen. There, there was even some commentary I read on the weekend that the U.S. is like some of the numbers are lining up. From, I think the CPI comes out this week. There is an argument being made the U.S. could even increase rates once more. Hey, that would be a reversal of what <laughs> we've been talking about, but I uh, can't expect it to hold this week. ABP renames emerging cattle influenza to bovine influenza A virus or BIAV. Much discussion has been going out uh, on the emerging cattle influenza situation. But uh, quote here, because this infection is in, is in cattle, it's not the same as the highly pathogenic avian influenza, HPAI. After thoughtful consideration and discussion with many experts, the Association of Bovine Practitioners will now refer to, the, to it as BIAV. So when you see that, that's, that's the difference now. And of course, more info, and there was more infections on the weekend. This is something that was being followed very, very closely in the cattle industry uh, from a best management practices standpoint, some of the impact on milk production, and still no cases found in Canada as of yet. But one has to ask, is it a case of if or, or when on, on that front? Bulls on the defensive in the cattle market. Cattle futures finished poorly last Friday, posting a technical breakdown and ending virtually on their weekly lows. That sets the cattle market up for follow-through selling to open this week with risk of further active long liquidation. We're talking more about this in the beef market update. Cattle, cattle need a good week. Live cattle need, they need a strong week. April hogs hold premium to rising cash index. The CME lean hog index is up another 43 cents to 86.31 as of April 4th, continuing the seasonal rise since the beginning of the year. April lean hog futures finished Friday at $3.01 and $3 premium to today's cash quote. Another thing that people have been following very closely is what's happening in the oil market. You're seeing more and more uh, articles about, hey, you know, $100 oil. Goldman Sachs says not very likely. The commodities research team at Goldman, led by Dan Struven, gives three reasons why the Brent price may not reach $100. The first says Goldman is the, that forecast already assumed global oil demand growth of 1.5 million barrels a day, which is above the IEA's expectations. Second, Goldman says its base case assumes no additional hits to supply from any geopolitical escalation. And third, Goldman reckons that high levels of spare capacity in OPEC Plus will encourage the cartel to raise production with crude supply from the eight countries, which announced a package of cuts in June and November last year, increasing by 1.2 million barrels per day from July through to November in 2024. Red Sea crisis fueling surge in international air freight demand. The Wall Street Journal reports uh, airborne shipping is expensive experiencing unseasonably strong double-digit growth. Increased demand is attributed to strong business from Asia and the Middle East to Europe. Companies are adjusting supply chains in response to geopolitical shockwaves and disruptions. Attacks by Yemen's Houthi rebels on commercial shipping in the Red Sea are per prompting ocean carriers to take longer routes around Africa. Rising volumes at European seaports are uh, seem fur farther from the conflict which more combined sea air transport through hubs like Dubai. Bottom line, average spot rates from the Middle East and South Asia to Europe were up 71% in March compared to last year, driving up air freight prices. And the thing is, air freight, not more economical. Air freight, very expensive, right? You, it's, it's just more costly to fly a plane, less, uh, you're, you're spreading out less volume of cargo over that flight. So, yeah, that, that is definitely not something that is really super conducive to uh, cheaper products out there for sure. And that's all the time we have for today's top ag news stories of the day. I encourage you to send me an email, shaney at realagriculture.com. Or, of course, you can find us across all the different social media platforms. Or why not call the Real Ag Feedback Line? The number, of course, is 855-776-6100. Four, seven. I want to thank everybody out there for getting real and getting connected with Real Ag Radio. And we will, of course, chat again tomorrow. Cheers, everybody. Thank you for downloading this Real Ag Radio podcast brought to you by High Performing Carbine Insecticide from FMC. Carbine Insecticide hits aphids hard with effective, selective, extended control. It also has activity on lagus and tarnished plant bugs. 
Ask your retailer today.